Well, before I start, um, I want to have a little disclaimer. Uh, when I saw that on the uh, preaching roster that today's sermon was a preacher's choice, uh, I instantly, and I mean instantly, I knew what passage I was going to preach on, or at least I thought I did until I talked to Bernard about it. <laughs> and that passage, that passage was actually the one that Rise has just read, uh, the Revelation passage. Uh, and the reason for that is because earlier in this year I listened to a sermon on that passage uh, and I was tremendously struck by that passage. and It's weighed on me throughout the year, uh, both as an individual, as a, a husband and a father, and as a, a warden of our church. Uh, so I said to Bernard Ryder, that's what I'm preaching on. He said, oh, no, don't preach on that. Everyone will expect that. And... Um, he said, preach on Hebrews 2 because it picks up on the same themes. So consequently, I didn't have the sermon written in my head that I thought I had, so I had to, I had to prepare another one, which was great. Um, so I guess what I want to say from all of that is uh, if you feel my fingers pointing at you, remember that those that I'll think of three fingers, six fingers are pointing back at me. Uh, so with that in mind, I'll pray and then I'll read Hebrews Heavenly Father, thank you that in your word uh, you don't hold back. Uh, There are tough teachings uh, in your word for us uh, as individuals and as churches. Uh, Heavenly Father, help us to take to heart your words. Uh, I pray that that my words uh, are your words and that you will speak to all of us um, through your word today. Amen. Uh, So on page... Um, 1061, is that right? Yep, yep. there's no page number at the top. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. For this reason, we must pay attention all the more to what we have heard, so that we will not drift away. For if the message spoken through angels was legally binding, and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment, How will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? This salvation had its beginning when it was spoken of by the Lord, and it was confirmed to us by those who heard him. At the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles and distributions of gifts from the Holy Spirit according to his will. This is the word of the Lord. Well, Jesus is better. In fact, Jesus is best. That's what the author of the letter to the Hebrews wants us to know. As good and great as everything was that preceded him during the time of the old covenant under Moses and even in David and Solomon's time, Jesus is better. Jesus is immeasurably superior to anything that your heart can conceive or your mind can imagine. Jesus Christ is God's full and final revelation to the world of what is good and true and beautiful and eternal. He is the one who by God's decree will inherit everything. After all, everything was created through him. He is the radiance of God's glory and the exact, precise expression and embodiment of what God is like. He holds up and carries along by his powerful word the whole of the universe so that what God has ordained to come to pass will come to pass. And by the sacrifice of himself on the cross, he cleansed us from the defilement and stain of our sin and then sat down at the right hand of God on high. His sovereign rule is forever and ever It was to Jesus Christ and no one else that God the Father said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. There are similar descriptions elsewhere in the New Testament, aren't there? In the opening chapter of John's Gospel, we are told that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God and the Word was God. And that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
And in that great passage in Colossians, Paul says that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So, first hard question, how important is all of that to you? Do you see it as of most important eternal value? Or is it best mildly intriguing and interesting for a moment or or two? Well, verse 1 of chapter 2 of Hebrews tells us how important it should be. For this reason, we must pay attention all the more to what we have heard so that we will not drift away. I'm a farmer, not a teacher, so I won't ask for a show of hands, but I hope you took some time to read Hebrews 1 this week, uh, at least once. Did you notice that there are no commands, no demands, no obligations, no responsibilities in Hebrews chapter 1? Rather, chapter 1 is a glorious list of breathtaking assertions about Jesus. But here in verse 1 of chapter 2, we have the first command or imperative or exhortation in the book of Hebrews. And it is here that we run smack into the force and urgency of, for this reason. Or as some translations say, therefore. This is the author's way of saying, because Jesus is God's final word to mankind, because Jesus is himself God, because Jesus is creator and sustainer and Lord over all things, and because Jesus is infinitely superior to the angels, we must pay closer attention to what we've heard about him and read of him and have come to know about him. Pay very, very close attention to what you have just read, it says. Listen very, very intently to what you've just heard. This isn't optional. This isn't just good advice, and it goes far beyond mere suggestion. This is a command we must. This is a matter of immediate, constant, and eternal urgency. Every one of you is going to die. Unless Jesus returns, every person in this building or watching online is going to die. Whether within minutes or years or decades, all of us will die, whether by cancer or car accident, war, heart disease, old age, or by some other means. Slowly or quickly, peaceful or violent, we are all going to die. And when you do, there will be only one thing that ultimately matters, only one thing that will determine what happens next. And that one thing, in the words of Hebrews 2, is whether or not you paid much closer attention to what the Bible says about Jesus. You can't wait until after you die. It will be too late by then. I should have mentioned, you probably know anyway, there's an outline on the inside of the, of the news sheet, um, and at point two now. I know that many of you pay very close attention to the news, to stories of war and national upheaval, and the weather and floods and droughts and earthquakes. I know that many of you closely follow the fluctuations in share prices, fuel prices and the Australian dollar. I know that you listen intently to the music on your playlist and carefully read every email, text, watch TikTok and Snapchat that's sent your way. I know that you devote hours to watching TV and sport, surfing the internet, reading books or magazines. That's what we all find easy to listen to, isn't it? to pay close attention to. But when you die, will any of that matter? The only thing that matters eternally and therefore ought to matter most right now is what you do with the person known as Jesus of Nazareth, the person who all those stunning statements in Hebrews 1 are made about. It might be the first time in Hebrews, but it isn't the last time that we hear this kind of urgent plea. In Hebrews chapter 3, we are told to consider Jesus. In chapter 12, we're told to look to Jesus. And why should we do this? Why must we do this? 
Because only in and through and because of Jesus do we have access to what the author describes in chapter 2, verse 3 as such a great salvation. If you choose not to pay close attention to Jesus and not to consider him and not to look to him and think of him and pursue him and study him and trust him, if you should choose not to obey this author's command, if instead you choose to neglect this great salvation that he has provided, you will not escape. So why would anybody not respond to this urgent command in the way we should? Given what we've seen and heard in Hebrews 1 concerning Jesus, what possible excuse could anyone have? What possible explanation could anyone give for not paying much closer attention to who Jesus is and what he has done? The only reason would be that people think whether they admit it or not, that other things are more valuable, more beautiful, more satisfying, more necessary, more important, better than Jesus. If you don't pay close, consistent, daily, wholehearted attention to the good news of God about Jesus, what will happen? Well, our writer says it as clearly as anyone possibly could. You will begin to drift away. What does he mean by this? I'm at point three now, and the Greek word translated drift away is not used anywhere else in the New Testament. But it's frequently found in other literature. For example, it describes an arrow slipping out of a quiver or snow sliding down a mountain or a ring slipping off a finger. The most obvious thing to us when we think of drifting is a boat. Life is not a calm, still lake. It is a river, and if we aren't actively working against the current, then we drift away with it. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, the writer speaks of Christian hope as an anchor, an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. So the good news of salvation is a solid, fixed, immovable port to which we must carefully anchor ourselves so that we don't drift away. Um, I want you to think more about this drifting. Um, do you know what you have to do to drift? Nothing. Nothing at all. Don't do anything and you will drift. Take Christianity lightly and you will drift. Treat it casually or not at all and you will drift. To drift away implies a carelessness and a lack of attention. This is not a person who suddenly rejects their faith in a moment of anger, but rather someone who makes tiny compromises over a long period of time. Instead of being carefully devoted to Jesus, this person just floats along with the tide. We've all been swimming between the flags, I'm sure, mucking around with siblings or friends, and suddenly there's a loud voice, usually mum, but probably the lifeguard, Back between the flags. Get back between the flags. Because without even knowing it, you have drifted away out of the flags. And friends, that is the Christian life. It's not that you will swim out of the flags towards a rip, but if you don't pay careful attention, you will, little by little, drift towards that rip. You'll be taken away and there will be no rescue. Merely showing up at a church service like this is no proof that you aren't drifting. Most who drift, I would say all who drift, are regular in their church attendance, at least to start with. They are regular because they think that being physically present must be the opposite of drifting. But it's not, is it? The opposite of drifting isn't merely being present, it's listening to paying close attention to, believing in, growing in love for and devoting your entire life to Jesus every day. Being present in a church service or a Bible study group or volunteering in some ministry doesn't mean you aren't drifting and in danger of perishing. Those things are an important expression of what it means to hold fast to Jesus 
to adore him and prize him and treasure him. But it's important that we don't get them mixed up. Maybe some of you here today are drifting. You see the gospel every week. You hear the gospel often. You are told of Jesus. You may even read your Bible. But do you diligently and passionately pay close attention to the good news of Jesus, of what God has done for sinners in Jesus? Is there focused or fixed faith in Jesus, a pursuit of him, a desire to grow in knowledge about him? No, you are probably standing still, you think. You think that because you are not actively swimming outside of those flags, not living in open rebellion, that you're okay. But you are drifting. If you don't listen more carefully to Jesus and consider him daily and fix your eyes on him regularly then you won't just stand still. It's not possible. You will drift. You will just float away. In Galatians 1, Paul says that he's amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Jesus and are turning to a different gospel. In Revelation chapter 2, in the letter to Ephesus, Jesus says, you have abandoned the love you had at first. In our reading from Revelation chapter 3 today, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. These people are drifting or have drifted. But who are all these warnings sent to? They aren't sent to the pagan world, are they? No, they are sent to Christians to churches following the way of Jesus less than 70 years after his death and resurrection, to people just like you and me. And now it's very easy and right to point our finger at liberal dioceses and bishops and say that this applies to them, and of course it does. But before we do that, we need to examine our own heart and see if Jesus is indeed saying those things to us as individuals and as a church. Come on, Andrew, does it really matter all that much? You sure you aren't blowing this out of proportion? Maybe you're saying this because you want to be the topic of conversation at morning tea or lunch when we leave here, heaven forbid. I'm at point four now and I can't stop you from thinking anything like that. All I can do is point you to what the writer says of the urgency and importance of this. He says it in verse 2 and the first half of verse 3. For if the message spoken through angels was legally binding and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Now, the message here is the Mosaic law, God's revelation of himself and his will in the Old Covenant. And Acts and Galatians tell us that angels served as instruments or intermediaries in the giving of the law. And everything that God communicated through angels was absolutely reliable. Or, to say another way, it was perfect and trustworthy. So it was completely right and just for God to punish those who disobeyed the Mosaic law. The just punishment for violating some principles of the Mosaic law was physical death, stoning by the rest of the, uh, the Israelites. That's as, about as extreme as it could get in terms of punishment, isn't it? But the author of Hebrews argues from the lesser to the greater. If there was such severe punishment from God for violating the terms of a lesser covenant delivered by angels, surely there will be much greater punishment for violating the terms of a greater covenant brought to us by God's own son's death and resurrection. And what could be worse than physical death? Well, spiritual or eternal death. In other words, the writer of Hebrews is saying that what is at stake in your drifting away, in your neglecting the great salvation that has come in Jesus, is our eternity. 
One of the unmistakable signs that you are a true child of God, born again and justified by faith alone in Jesus Christ, is that if you are drifting, you won't continue in it for long. If you're a true child of God, you will hear this message and feel the pain in your conscience, which is the Holy Spirit bringing conviction to you or to me. The evidence that you are a true child of God is that you will sense a desire to turn your eyes and ears and most importantly your heart back to Jesus and be attentive and devoted to who he is, to what he says and to all that he has done. One of the signs that you may not be born again or justified by faith alone in Christ is that my words, or far more importantly, the warnings of Hebrews 2, has little or no impact on your heart. Now you hear this and shrug your shoulders or set it aside thinking, you're taking this a bit seriously. You're a bit over the top, Andrew. Now you might be asking, why these warnings if in the end nothing can separate us from Jesus? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. You might be wondering what this means for the doctrine or the teaching of eternal security or the idea that the true born-again child of God cannot lose their salvation. Well, firstly, let me say that I firmly believe that that is true. But let me show you with an illustration and then a verse from the next chapter of Hebrews. Uh, If you go walking at Kaputar or in the Blue Mountains, you will see warning signs about steep cliffs, unstable edges and sharp rocks. Now, wise walkers might not need those warnings, but does that mean that we don't put them up there in places to remind people to be careful? Uh, In Hebrews chapter 3, Uh, Verse 14, the writer says, We have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly until the end the reality that we had at the start. He talks of the reality or confidence that we had at the start in Christ. He says that we have become, that's in the past, it's already happened, participants in Christ if we hold firmly to the reality or the original confidence firmly to the end. It is our ongoing perseverance in faith, our not drifting away, that demonstrates or proves that we genuinely came to share in Christ in the past. So the holding firm, the not drifting, the not neglecting this great salvation is the evidence or the proof that we genuinely trusted Christ in the first place. The alternative, frankly, is unbearable to think about. If we neglect our salvation and drift away and don't hear or feel the prodding of the Holy Spirit to return, then we will not escape. That is what the writer to Hebrews says. It is no wonder that we are told to run the race to win the prize, to run with endurance the race that is set before us. Well, if you're still wondering why this is such a serious subject, The passage is more. First, the salvation provided for sinners by Jesus Christ is exceedingly and indescribably great. This is no mundane salvation, no routine deliverance, no run-of-the-mill forgiveness. In Christ, God has redeemed us from slavery to sin. He has wiped clean the stain of guilt and shame. He has removed all grounds for condemnation. He has forgiven us freely and fully if only we would trust and treasure Jesus and what he did on the cross on our behalf. In Christ, God has reconciled himself to us. He has adopted us into his family. He has imputed or transferred the righteousness of Jesus to us and declared that we are acceptable in his sight. He has put his spirit in our hearts as an abiding presence and a promise that the works that he has begun in us he will fully and finally bring to completion, giving us eternal life in his presence. This salvation is great because through it we are brought into loving and wholehearted intimacy with the creator of everything that we can see and plenty that we can't. 
This salvation is great because it restores hope to the despairing, it brings freedom to the enslaved, it enables the shameful to feel clean, it takes the depressed and gives them joy, it gives purpose to those who feel useless and gives value to those who say I'm worthless. Now that really is a great salvation. And that's why the threat of drifting away from it and neglecting it is so real and frightening. Second, the urgency of paying close attention to this salvation and fixing our faith on Jesus alone is of massive importance because of the way that God has confirmed the truth of the gospel. Um, Look in verse 3 and 4, there are three stages in this process of confirmation. Firstly, Jesus himself declared throughout his ministry that he had come to save sinners. His word of forgiveness and redemption for those who trust and treasure him was proclaimed loudly and clearly and with obvious evidence of his divine authority. Those who were eyewitnesses to Jesus while he was on the earth, who saw him and heard him and walked with him, in turn told us about their experience. And they wrote it down. They bore testimony that all he did and said was real and true. They were present when he cleansed the lepers, drove out demons, when he walked on water, when he refuted the Pharisees, and when he raised the dead. Thirdly, God the Father also bore witness to the truth of this message of salvation by granting signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Such displays of divine power confirmed and attested to the reality of of all that Jesus claimed to be. Uh, Finally, I'm at point five now, and there is nothing in life more important than paying more careful attention to the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And all of that means for us. We can't do it too often. It's impossible to spend too much time doing it. When life is hardest, fix your eyes on him. And life was hectic for Martin Luther as he led the Protestant Reformation when asked one day, how will you cope with all that extra work today? Luther replied, I will begin by spending even more time in prayer. When life is hard, fix your eyes on him. Spend time with him. When you sin, fix your eyes on him. Now, that's not our natural reaction because, like Adam, we want to hide. But only Jesus can save us from our sin. When you feel tired, sick, emotionally empty, fix your eyes on him. We easily fall prey to to bugs when our bodies are run down and weak. Likewise, sin takes hold when our physical and mental defences are down. So when you are tired and empty... Fix your eyes on him. Are you growing in your faith? Are we growing as a church? We can see God at work in and through us in many ways. But even here we can drift. Even in such a good, solid church, it is easy to just coast along. Others can pray. Others can serve. I'll be right. Are you fixing your eyes on him or are you drifting? Um, Those verses from Revelation, I couldn't help but put a bit of it in, that we heard earlier are a loud alarm and a bright flashing light, aren't they? Jesus was looking for the refreshment of cool water or the soothing of a hot tea or coffee. But what he found in that church was neither hot or cold, but lukewarm, unpalatable, unhelpful. It's worth examining ourselves, comparing us to that church. We're doing really well at Narrabri Anglican Church. Financially strong, putting money away for future ministry. Our attendance numbers are way above any other church in town. Lots of kids, lots of Bible studies. But how are we really going by the only measure that matters? 
What does Jesus think? Are we actually wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked? Deluded in our own greatness? How is your discipline of Bible reading? How is your discipline of prayer life? How is your love and service of one another? How is your hospitality? How is your concern for those who don't know about this great salvation? Brothers and sisters, I urge you to pay attention all the more to what we have heard so that we will not drift away. Let's pray. Um, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would keep us from drifting. I pray that, Father, that you would you would poke us, poke us hard if necessary um, to bring us, to turn us around to you, to cause in us repentance that leads to eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.